Hey there, what are you doing? Just looking at birds. Welcome, I'm your host Chris. Join me as I interview avid birders to learn more about birds, birding, and those who love both. Today my guest is Dan Weiss. After a career in public education, he retired to spend more time outdoors. During that time, he took up photography and volunteered at the Arizona Sonora Desert Museum with their renowned Raptor Free Flight Program as a narrator and a bird handler. Dan also participates in the Audubon Christmas Bird Count, which is how we came to know each other. It's great to have you on today. Thanks for having me, Chris. So yesterday, while I was birding at the Sweetwater Wetlands, I came upon a greater roadrunner that let me get within six feet of it and accompany it on its hunts for insects. I was surprised at how close it allowed me to get. At one point, I had to back up because my lens couldn't focus that close. Have you had any close encounters with a bird lately? Um, I'm not sure if I've had a similar experience, although there are a lot of birds that, like that greater roadrunner at wetlands who are comfortable around humans. They've seen so many birders and people walking that they understand what you're trying to do there. And they're also conscious of what we humans do and ready to fly and bolt at a moment's notice. But, you know, I've had recently hummingbirds will come up to me as I'm changing the hummingbird feeders out on my porch and, and things like that. Uh, it's always fascinating when you're in the world with a bird and it feels comfortable with you, uh, even as it's aware of who you are and what you're doing there. Yes. When you're out birding, what is one thing that you have to remind yourself of? Mostly to pay attention. Uh, for me, it's real easy to just sort of get lost in my own thoughts and forget what I'm doing out there. I, <laughs> and so it's just a reminder to pay attention to what's around me, to sounds and movements, and to keep my eyes roaming across the environment and, and looking in all directions. So it's just remembering to be aware and to be present in the moment. I think that's always a good thing to do. What do you enjoy most about birding? You know, I think there are two things that I enjoy about birding. One is just being outside. Uh, feels good for me to be outside in nature, uh, whether I'm seeing much of anything in particular or just, again, being in the here and now. That alone is very pleasurable. But seeing any kind of wildlife, whether it's birds or insects or reptiles or whatever, all of those things just uh, bring a little magic to the day. And it always feels like a blessing when, when you get to see uh, nature and Mother Nature uh, showing their face. So that, that's the, the pleasure that I get out of being out in the world. When did you first take an interest in birding? I mean, my early 20s, I had a friend at the job that I worked with who was a, a real birder. He was a fellow my age. He's someone whose father had been a birder and had taken him all around the country as a child to all these birding places. So Peter knew birds very well. And we became friends and he invited me out to go birding with him. And so through that friendship, I began to understand the world of birding and began to appreciate it. Do you remember any of the birds you saw during that first few times? Not at all. And, <laughs> and uh, I may have mentioned to you before, sometimes I define myself as a, a birder similar to the movie Groundhog Day. You know, I may see a bird, enjoy it, look and read about it, and then a week later see the new bird again and think, oh, that's an interesting bird. I wonder what <laughs> it is and wonder what I know about it. So I, I continue to relearn what I forget. But I think the pleasure is in finding something and enjoying it for the moment and then learning more about it if you can. So hopefully I'll remember a little bit each time, but it never surprises me to uh, realize I already knew that bird and I had seen <laughs> it before, but I'm seeing it new for the second time. I was going to say, I don't think that's a bad thing to have a short memory. So each time you see the bird, you're excited once again to see it. Always. And that's one of the things that I know for myself anyway. And, uh, you know, I can see the same bird over and over again. I have cardinals that come to a feeder in my backyard and they're spectacular birds, but I don't get tired of them. Every time I see them, it, it's like, wow, look at that bird. And it's just fascinating to watch its behavior in particular and, and just to study how it, it moves about the environment. But every bird has its own characteristics and are fascinating to see whether it's what people describe as just a, you know, it's just a house sparrow, just a morning dove, or some of the more spectacular birds. Uh, they all are, are pretty in their own way. I always find sparrows quite amusing. I think that was one of the first birds I took an interest in, yeah. just watching them hop around and peck at the ground. I always found it fascinating, even though some people might call them just a sparrow. Well, the thing is, some of those birds that are just uh, birds are the ones you get to see often. 
So if you don't appreciate them, then you're some kind of bird elitist or something. <laughs> so, uh, you know, you may want to see a variety of birds and different kind of birds, but the birds that are around you are the ones that are there to enjoy. I agree. Uh, many of our listeners are new to birding. Mm -hmm. What is a piece of advice you would share with them? Uh, you know, the, the main thing I would say to them is that they don't have to be any different birder than they want to be. Um, I, I brought a quote to share with you from Ken Kaufman, who's one of America's most well-known birders. And he often is asked to define what is a birder, what is a bird watcher. And, and his statement is, birding is something that we do for enjoyment. So if you enjoy it, you're a good birder. If you enjoy it a lot, you're a great birder. So for anyone that's new, uh, it's like being new in any field. Recognize that there's lots that you don't know, but you can learn at your own pace. You don't have to be a lister. You don't have to chase birds. You can if you want to. Just find what, what you enjoy and find the resources to help you learn and just enjoy the time you have, whether it's just sitting on your porch and looking at birds or going out on your own, or finding friends or people in the community who will take you out. Be at peace with the level of birder you are, and make sure you enjoy what you're doing. I think that's a great perspective to have. Mm -hmm. One of the things as people get more into birding is they want to identify the birds they see. Mm -hmm. When it comes to bird identification, what resource have you found most useful? When I started out, uh, of course, we didn't have cell phones that, that <laughs> brought encyclopedias with them, and so I would refer to bird books. Uh, I'm more of a learner uh, by by talking to people and listening to people. It's easier for me to take in information that way. So for me, it was understanding how I learn. You know, I would take some notes in the field, go and look at books. Now, uh, what I find real easy is having a few apps on my phone that I can go to. And so if I have a question about a bird or a bird sound or, or something, I can access that information very, very quickly. And uh, so that's what I use to help me when I'm out and about in the field. Okay. When birding, uh, some people use all sorts of gear. Some people just have a pair of binoculars. Uh, I think you can you can go as far as you want with that, as far as the clothing you wear, the gear you bring along. Mm -hmm. Thinking about that, what is something you've purchased for less than $100 that has had the largest impact on your birding experience? You know, again, birding is free. You don't need anything to bird. Sure. Uh, whether it's sitting on your backyard, walking in a community park or, or anything, uh, the, the thing that's been most helpful for me over the last number of years is two particular birding apps. I have several different birding apps on my phones. Sometimes they're free, sometimes they're 10 or maybe $20 at the most, sure. but they carry a wealth of information. Uh, I use iBird Pro a lot. That's my go-to app to study birds. But the other that I love is Sibley because you can compare two birds side by side and hold up two different species side by side um, if you're not sure which it is and are trying to figure out what field marks to look at. So those are very handy tools. They aren't very expensive. Whether you use them in the field on your phone or use them when you're back in your car or sitting at home, uh, those are wonderful. And then, then at home, another free source resource is all the things that are on the internet. And allaboutbirds.org is a fabulous site to go to that really brings a lot of data and allows you places to go look for more data. Um, so those are the best things. Allaboutbirds.org costs you nothing. And the other two apps are really wonderful that I've found to use in the field. I've heard of Sibley, but I hadn't heard of iBird Pro. What is one of the advantages of that app or one of the reasons you chose that app? You know, I'm not sure at the beginning. The reason I use it now, though, is because it lists similar birds. So if you're not sure, you can look at the bird you think it is and then click on similar birds and go to their page on the web. It just, for me, it has a variety of, a number of different photographs too, both drawings and photographs of a bird, because often the picture of birds that are used in any kind of bird guide may not look exactly like what you're looking at in the field. Yes. The pictures or representations are drawn for different reasons, and birds in different seasons look differently. In different parts of the country, they look different. And for me, iBird Pro has the variety that makes it uh, easy to use and easy to access all the different information about them. So if you have an inkling as to what it might be by the time you bounce around a few of those different birds, you can narrow it down pretty yes. well. And one bird app that a lot of beginning birders go to a lot is called Merlin. 
Okay. Yeah, which I've was a tool that. developed by Cornell. And it's interesting because it takes all the millions and millions of bits of data that people have put on eBird and collects it so that if you're out in the field and you're wondering about a bird, it knows what your GPS location is. It knows what birds have been seen in that area. And you answer a few questions of approximately how big was the bird? What was it doing? You know, was it sitting on the ground, sitting up in a tree? What are two or three of the major colors on the bird? And based on that information and the information and data that it has in eBird, it says, it comes up with some answers to you and says, was your bird this? And it shows a picture with links to more data or is, was your bird this or this? So it's not a hundred percent accurate yeah. because what you see and how you describe it may not be helpful, but it's a very good tool for beginners to start to look at, to point them in the right direction. Sounds like it. Now let's move on to our bird segment, where my guest has a chance to share a bit about a bird of their choice. And for this episode, Dan has chosen the great horned owl. Where are these owls typically found? Well, great horned owls are the quintessential owl. We have a, a number of species throughout North America, um, but great horned owls are the, the most well-known. They're one of the largest. And when you think of an owl, that's probably what you're thinking of. When you hear the sound of an owl in a movie, on a TV show, in a cartoon, when you make an owl sound for your children, you're making the sound of a great horned owl. So that's one of the reasons why I chose that. They are generalists and they live in a variety of habitats. So when you ask where they're found, they can be found in deserts, on mountains, in wetlands, in agricultural areas, in cities. They really are generalists with where they live. And so that makes them available to people throughout the country. The, the particular habitat ranges very much so in southern Arizona and Tucson, where we live, you might see a great horned owl nesting in the arms of a saguaro cactus. It may be nesting in a raptor's, uh, old raptor's nest on the top of a tall Aleppo pine. It may be nesting on the flat roof of your neighbor's house. So hmm. where you find them varies quite a bit, but that's what makes them special as you can find them in a variety of places. When you talk about them being generalists as far as where they choose to live, mm -hmm. uh, is their nesting place decided in any way by their food sources? Well, because there are two parts to that question. So as far as food sources, uh, great horned owls are generalists with where they live, but also generalists with where they eat. Mm -hmm. uh, I like to describe them as... Uh, uh, they are like the the uh, apex predator of the night sky. They will eat pretty much anything that hops, walks, crawls, swims, slithers, or flies. So <laughs> they want to be where there is food, but they will eat pretty much anything that comes along their way that is edible. Mm -hmm. As far as nesting sites, great horned owls don't build nests. Yes, they're a bird, but like many birds, they don't build nests. Uh, they do a few different things. They may usurp the nest of another large bird. So if a heron built a bird in a wetlands, uh, built a nest, nest, not built a bird, built sure. a nest in a wetlands area last year, the great horned owl, which is the, one of the earliest birds to breed, will come along and say, here's a good, nice looking nest. Nobody's using it now in December. I think I'll just make that my home. A raven's nest, any large raptor. You know, here in the Southwest, we have uh, Harris hawk nest, uh, red tailed hawk nest, Cooper's hawk's nest. All of those would be a perfect nest for a great horned owl. And they basically will just take it over again because they nest early in the season. And uh, they're, they're pretty capable at defending their nest site too. Um, but they also will nest in a tree hollow. They'll nest on a ledge on a cliff. They'll nest on a empty flower pot on the top shelf of Home Depot or on a flat roof or, or pretty much anywhere that just seems like a good place to nest. <laughs> uh, they don't really add to the nest. They may do a tiny bit, but they're not going to bring in twigs or build a nest as we think that birds do. Hmm. So they'll build a nest in a good location. Their, their territories are big enough, so food doesn't have to be right under the particular nest, but it's in a large area where hunting is good. When you talk about them, do you often find owls with other owls? Owls are monogamous, and in breeding season and through much of the year, you might find a pair. Hmm. They don't hang around in flocks like other birds do. But often at night, you might hear a pair duetting, calling back and forth, particularly in advance of and throughout breeding season. At this time of year, from December through April, while they're establishing their territory, uh, 
getting ready to start to lay eggs incubating the eggs and feeding the young, you often will, if you hear one owl at sunset or during the night, you'll hear the other calling back from the nest. So you can find them in that location, but they are solitary as, as far as the fact that they don't, uh, they, they aren't seen in flocks. There aren't groupings hmm. of great horns owls like that. Okay. When is the best time to spot one of them? For me, it's always been during, at this time of year, during breeding season, when okay. they're dispersed, at the other times of the year, you may or may not be able to find them. But because during breeding season, they have one location where they're always going to roost, the, you mm. have the nest where the female is going to be sitting on it basically for a few months. And sure. the male is going to be within sight or with earshot during the day. If you see one, the other is nearby. If you hear one at sunset, then you know the other is nearby. And so this is a time of year where they're going to stick to one area and you, it increases your chances of seeing them. And if you do see one at this time of year, you're probably going to see it at the same place the next day and the day after that and two weeks from now because they're sticking close to the nest. Their role, like many animals, is to propagate their species, and that's their primary purpose. And they will be there to take care of the babies and to defend the babies and defend the nest. So, I've noticed uh, one of the trees near where I work, I've noticed a pair of great horned owls, and I've seen... When they're there together, you can see one is much larger than the other, and I'm assuming that's the female? Yes. Sometimes I'll notice that the female is absent and only the male is there. Rarely will I see both of them. Mm -hmm. Most days, I'll just see the male. Is that because the female's in the nest with the babies, or is she out gathering food? Once the female starts laying eggs, she's going to sit on the nest all the time. Mm. When the babies hatch and get to a certain age, she, she may leave the nest to both... Uh, cast a pellet at the beginning of the night, at the end of the night. Uh, as the babies get older, she may leave the nest to go take food from the male when he hunts and brings it back. But otherwise, she's going to be spending pretty much all of her time on the nest. Hmm. Again, she's got to incubate the eggs, keep them warm, keep them sheltered from the weather and the elements, uh, protect them from any predator that, that uh, is looking at those eggs as a delicious food source. When you've seen them together, it probably was before she laid eggs. And okay. so they're doing some kind of pair bonding and hanging out together. Once uh, once she's on the nest, though, the male will keep his distance. And even when mm -hmm. the babies hatch, the male may be nearby and within sight, mm -hmm. but he's not going to be side by side with her. Okay. The size difference is a really good way to tell the difference between the female and male. She's mm -hmm. larger. If you hear them at night, even though the female is larger, when the two birds are duetting, calling back and forth, the male, as a smaller bird, has a deeper voice. Hmm. So as you listen to the two, the one with the, the uh, higher pitched voice is the female. The other thing that you might notice at this time of year, if you're looking at a single bird, is the females will show what's called a brood patch. And a brood patch is something that female birds develop during breeding season. They lose the feathers on their breast. So when mm -hmm. you look at them, it's like if you had a coat that buttons up, but you folded it together, you don't see the bare skin. But what you'll see is a part in the feathers, a vertical part during the front of the feathers. And that shows where the brood patch is. And the purpose of that is so when the female is incubating the eggs, instead of the, the eggs feeling the body warmth of the mom through this down feathery blanket, it's mm. skin to egg. And similarly, mm. when the babies are born, it's skin to babies. So it's direct heat from the mom. Mm. And those feathers will grow back out after the season. But uh, you might be able to find pictures on the web. I could send you one that very clearly shows a clean part, a vertical part, just like a part in my hair yeah. of where the feathers don't exist anymore on her breast. So those are a couple of different ways to identify and differentiate the female from the male. Yeah, please do send one. We'll include it in the show notes. Okay. One thing I want to come back to, some of our listeners may not know this term, but you mentioned casting a pellet. Yes. Could you elaborate on that? So here's where I'm going to be general rather than exact. And okay. it's, it's both purposeful and also because I always fumble on facts. But basically, owls, uh, great horned owls will swallow their prey whole or in big chunks. If it's a, a big prey item that they have to rip apart, uh, they don't chew. Birds don't chew like we do. They just swallow it whole. Their body uh, cannot digest all the elements of a prey item. So fur or bones do not get digested and dissolved within the bird's stomach. And so those items are 
sort of sent back up the system. They're gathered together in a, in a part of the esophagus of the bird. And at some point, it's kind of like a cat uh, coughing up a fur ball. Hmm. The bird will cast out this pellet, which is all the undigestible items, uh, whether it's the, the shell of an insect or the bones of a rodent or fur, those things are cast out. Many elementary school students in fourth, third, fourth, fifth grade may have done science experiments where they've gotten the pellet of a great horned owl and carefully taken it apart to try to figure out what the owl had eaten. And they end up with a skeleton of some little rodent that had been fed to the owl. And hmm. it's something that many birds do. Birds of prey will do that, but also many other birds that are not birds of prey, songbirds, cast pellets. It's all based on the fact that they can't, uh, their system can't digest a lot of the hard items that they swallow. And so it's, it just sort of regurgitated in a way in a little ball to clear the esophagus so they can continue eating. Hmm. So one way you asked about finding owls, there are two ways that you may be fortunate to find where they roost. One is if you're walking down a sidewalk somewhere and you see a whole bunch of white splotches on the ground, look straight up and an owl may be sitting there or it may be a, a spot where an owl roosts at some point or perches during the night. The other thing you might find if you're very lucky is owl pellets on the ground. Mm -hmm. And if you know there's an owl in your neighborhood, you hear it and somewhere you come across a spot where there are a whole bunch of a sort of egg-sized clumps of muddy-looking stuff. Those may be owl pellets. And again, that's a spot where the owl goes to cast its pellet at mm -hmm. the start of the night or at the end of the night. And uh, if you're lucky, you'll see the owl. If you don't see it, you know it's nearby. So they typically cast pellet in a nearby area or in one location? Yeah, they don't, they don't mess in their nest, but they're creatures of habit. Mm -hmm. And so I imagine that the owls, when they leave the nest at night, to basically to relieve themselves of that obstruction, they don't want to travel far and wide to do that. It's sort of, let me go to a spot where I'm safe and I can take the time to, to cough up the pellet and then be ready to eat again. That makes sense. I've also read something about owls' exceptional talent st strength, in this case, the great horned owl. Mm -hmm. How do they utilize this strength or how does that come into play when they are hunting or dealing with prey? So all predatory birds have different ways that they use to both catch their prey and to, to, to kill their prey or to make it ready and safe for eating. With owls, their talons are the tools that they use to grab the prey and to kill them. Hmm. Uh, I've heard that uh, great horned owls have a, a grip strength of 500 pounds per square inch. Typical human adult, someone strong and in the you know their vital youth like you if even if you're working out real well your grip strength may be 100 120 pounds per square inch so that little two pound great horned owl basically can squeeze three or four times as hard as you can yeah. and when you're squeezing and you've got an inch long uh, needle sharp talon you can do some damage to your prey what i learned a few years ago which was fascinating was i thought that much like boa constrictors, they squeeze their prey to stop the prey from breathing, and that's what kills them. But that actually is not what happens. They've studied how squeezing impacts their prey. And what they learned was that by squeezing, they stop blood flow. And when you stop blood flow to the brain, you will faint very quickly. You can live mm -hmm. without oxygen longer than you can stay alert and with it without blood to your brain. And so basically, they squeeze... Assuming the talons didn't pierce a vital organ, didn't pierce a spine or something like that, that yes. squeezing will stop blood flow to the brain and cause their prey to pass out. And then the prey is docile and then the owl can go about their business without having an animal trying to wiggle free or bite back or scratch or anything. Hmm. Will they consume it uh, on, on location per se or do they take it back to their nest and then consume it after it's fainted? Well, again, they, they may or may not... So an owl is going to eat somewhere near where it catches its prey. Yes. Um, they they will take it back to the nest if they're handing it off to the, the female on the nest mm. or if they're taking it there so the female can tear it apart in pieces to feed the babies. But otherwise, once they catch their prey, they'll they'll find a nearby spot to eat and consume it. If it's small, they will swallow it whole. Mm -hmm. You know, if it's a small rodent or an insect or a very small animal. If it's larger, they'll take it somewhere where they can tear pieces off and, and eat it in chunks. Hmm. You've captured some beautiful shots of 
the Great Horned Owl. Thank you. Uh, some of which you've shared with us will be in the show notes. But considering their incredible vision and hearing, have you found it difficult to approach one for a picture? One of the things that's interesting about Great Horned Owls in particular is that if you see one, they're likely to stay still and either just sleep or stay still and watch you. And I think part of that is their understanding that you are not a threat. We humans can't jump up in the air. I mean, uh, humans have done damage with weapons, of course, but the owl is going to sit there and watch. Um, so I haven't, I can't remember being in a situation where I flushed a great horned owl, where I got too close to it, where it felt threatened and left. But you can see it from a distance. They're large birds. And people who see great horned owls in their backyard report that the owls just watch them as the humans go about their business in the yard. There are other birds, your songbirds, that if you stepped out your back door would scatter. But the owl is in a different kind of uh, state of being, I guess. And so they'll just sit and watch you and try to assess what you're doing or just learn from you what they're watching you. So... You mentioned these great horned owls being pretty comfortable with humans, uh, knowing that we aren't a threat. Uh, but in some ways, some of our behaviors are a threat to great horned owls. Uh, can you tell me a little bit about that? Like many raptors, owls are su susceptible to human behavior that endangers them. It's always rough being a, a bird, being a bird of prey. And the first year of life, raptors and owls have a very high mortality rate for a number of reasons. It could be from starvation. It could be from predation. It could be from weather. But humans bring in some extra dangers to owls. One of the main ways is by setting out uh, rodenticides or poisons to kill rodents that we don't like. Uh, those things remain in the rodents' bodies. And if an owl sees a rat struggling slowly on the ground or just laying there, it, it looks like an easy meal. The owl will then eat the rodent and the pesticides will impact the owl. Um, owls uh, can, you know, humans have done damage purposefully, whether it's kids or adults that are shooting an arrow at the owl or they feel the owl is a danger to their pets or something and will throw rocks at them. And uh, so that is a hazard as well. Sometimes we damage or remove nests. Um, that great horned owl can make a mistake and fly into a car that's driving or, or things like that. But usually through just sort of loss of habitat and poisons, uh, those are ways that we endanger the, the owls around us. I know some people are worried when they have smaller dogs or cats. A lot of people think that these owls might just pick them up and they might say, you know, I don't want to leave my dog in the backyard because I'm afraid an owl will pick it up. How realistic is that? You can look at very many sources on the Internet that will tell you that owls are a danger to your pets, to your cats and dogs. But there really isn't any science behind that. And uh, I want to talk for a while about that. I think when people have a poor understanding of that and worry about great horned owls in particular being a danger to their pets, that they are doing a disservice to the animal and they are helping people to be afraid of owls rather than understanding them. So let me talk about it from a few different ways. Uh, earlier, I did say that owls are generalists with what they eat. They will eat anything that hops, crawls, swims, slithers, or flies. But they're birds that want to survive. So uh, for one thing, uh, they're not going to take an animal or go after a predator who might kill them. You know, why would you go after something that could kill you when you can find a little bunny or a rodent that's going to, who's one of their main purposes in life is being a prey item for predators. <laughs> and and there are a couple other things. If you've owned a cat, I don't know whether you have or, so for people that have owned cats, if they've ever tried to give a cat a bath or if they've ever had to give their cat medicine, they understand that cats come equipped with weapons. <laughs> and so a bird attacking a cat is putting their life at risk. Hmm. There aren't very many things that uh, creatures want to eat in life where they're going to risk their own life to get a meal. There's a lot of easier meals than that. In addition, great horned owls in this part of the country might weigh two or two and a half pounds. They'll be larger in parts of the country where it's more humid or there's more rain, but maybe they'll top out at three pounds, give or take. They can't really carry more than their body weight. Mm -hmm. And even if they uh, are starving, they're going to eat about one quarter of their body weight. So most urban pets weigh more than two pounds, considerably more. Sure. If an owl were to attack it to eat it, the owl couldn't really carry it off or carry it off very far. If it were going to eat your pet, there would be lots of pet mess left all around because that owl is only going to eat a half a pound of, of food. And given 
the uh, prevalence of video cameras throughout the world these days, if great horned owls were taking dogs and cats, we'd see a whole bunch of videos and gruesome pictures on the internet, and they're just not there. Uh, several years ago, the University of Arizona, in studying this idea, did a study of owl pellets of great horned owls in Tucson. So it was a study of urban great horned owls where you have pets to try to see if pets really part of their diet. And so they collected uh, owl pellets from under known great horned owl nests and uh, Tell me what you think they found. What percentage of owl pellets had pet fur in them? Maybe 30%. That's a good guess. The answer was zero. Hmm. Concurrently, they did a study of urban coyotes. Again, in the middle of Tucson, they studied urban coyote scat and picked up coyote scat throughout the city. And guess what percentage of coyote scat had pet fur in it? Was it similar? 80%. Oh. So what's happening a lot is that People will see a great horned owl in a tree over there near their yard. They'll have their poor little uh, pet, you know, Fifi will be there, Spot, whatever, their, their darling pet who they adore, and they'll see the owl staring at them. What humans often think is that owl is looking at my pet and is going to eat them. He's saying that my cat looks delicious. Hmm. From the owl's point of view, all the owl is doing is just saying, hey, there's an animal. And that's it. It's not there's a prey item. It's there's an animal there. And in fact, it's looking at a cat or a dog as someone that may be a danger to its babies, to its owlets. And so the owl is staring at the pet and not thinking of food. People are worried about their cats or dogs. And they turn around, go back in the house and come back 10 minutes later. The owl's gone. And so is their pet. So they believe that the owl has taken their cat or dog, even though, again, the owl can't carry off more than two pounds or so. Sure. And, and they just will assume that the owl took their cat or dog. There are times when owls, great horned owls, will attack a pet. Mm -hmm. If they've got babies on a nest near you and your cat is walking under the tree, that mm -hmm. owl's going to let you know, I got babies up here, don't you dare think about it. And it will strafe the cat or dog. It will come down and tag them with those talons. It mm -hmm. may do that to the human. If you're too close, uh, sometimes great horned owlets will be on the ground or be low on a tree. And those mama and, and papa owls are going to do everything they can to protect the baby and use the, the weapons that they have. So people may see that and, again, assume that the owl is a threat to eat their cat or dog. The owl could, you know, tag a cat or dog and hook it accidentally and fly off with it for a short while. It is possible that owls, great horned owls, may eat a small cat or dog. But, again, it's, it's not on the menu. It's not scientifically base. There isn't a lot of evidence of it. And people, I hope, should understand that they don't have to worry about that and they should just enjoy having nature around them. And uh, the owl is not planning on eating their pets. <laughs> so, Thank you for the clarification. Uh, thanks for letting me uh, share that. That's something that's important to my heart and that I want to make people be aware of. Speaking of things that might be important to your heart, Earlier, we mentioned your participation in the Raptor Free Flight Program at the Arizona Sonora Desert Museum. What does free flight imply? Well, Raptor Free Flight is a wonderful educational program the museum offers to allow people to see and feel wild birds native to the southwest flying in their environment. I believe that the word free refers to the fact that the birds that we use are flying free of equipment. So unlike many other raptor shows, we don't have human beings walking out with the birds on the gloves. We don't open a curtain to show you the birds there. Our birds come flying in from out of nowhere in the desert. And as you watch them fly close to you back and forth, you won't see them wearing ankle bracelets or trailing leather jesses behind them. They are flying free of equipment, much as any bird of prey in the wild would be free of equipment and mm. uh, no evidence of human interaction. So that's part of the magic of what we do in presenting that program. Hmm. How did you get into this role? When I retired and began looking for things to do and, and for the direction of my life, I was looking at the Desert Museum's website and I saw that they were looking for volunteers, among other programs, for Raptor Free Flight. And my thought was, that seems really cool. I don't know what it entails, but I'd like to volunteer for that. And I turned in my application in February. Uh, in normal years, when we don't have a pandemic, they will interview for new volunteers in August or September. Hmm. 
And uh, what I know now is that they actually don't prefer people have bird handling experience because they want to train you in their methodology for how to work with birds. So mm. there have been some people who come in indicating they know how to handle birds and they don't listen because they already know what they think they know. Sure. Um, so it's not relevant. What I understood and what I've seen over the years is the, the staff and the trainers are looking for people who work well with other people who take direction well, and who want to enjoy being around birds. That's the main criteria. Uh, hmm. You don't need to have experience necessarily. You just have to have a desire and a, a willingness to learn and be part of the team. Being a part of that team, what does your role look like? Uh, I love what I'm doing, and I feel very grateful that I get to be a, a handler and participate in Raptor Free Flight. It's a very unique program. Uh, people in our community have seen it, and many visitors to Tucson come to see it. There are Raptor programs throughout the world. Uh, some are uh, as simple as educational programs with birds on a glove, and there are Raptor shows in many places in the world. I believe that what we do at the Desert Museum is very unique for uh, several different reasons. Uh, for one, we just use birds that are native to this part of the desert, uh, which is part of the mission of the Arizona Sonora Desert Museum. So we don't have a Eurasian eagle owl as part of the raptor free flight program or, or some other raptor from other parts of the world. Uh, we fly them in their native environment. So people aren't watching the show in built amphitheater or indoors or in some kind of strange setting. Hmm. You walk out into the desert on a part of the Desert Museum and the birds are presented. They come flying in from out in the desert. You don't see humans walking them in or humans walking them off. The birds kind of show up on cue, fly very close to the audience uh, within inches of their head, back and forth from dead tree snag to another tree snag, and then sort of on cue, just fly off and disappear in the desert. Mm. So it's very exceptional in, in what they do. And then thirdly, the way the trainers work is very unique. Uh, we hear Trainers, we're in contact with trainers from all over the country and the world. We hear visitors talk about other shows. The Desert Museum staff gets calls from programs throughout the world to try to find out how they do what they do because they're releasing a wild bird to the wild. And at the end of the demonstration, the wild bird flies back and says, I'm going back home. Hmm. Uh, you know, I'm not going to escape and run away from the world. The training methods that the Desert Museum uses are unique in that the birds are always in control of the choices they make. They're never mm -hmm. forced to do anything. Uh, the birds are never exposed to any negative consequences. It's only positive reinforcement, a bird choice, and everything is done with the welfare of the birds in mind. So uh, the birds have come to the Desert Museum a couple different ways. Some are rehab birds, some are birds that were hatched in captivity and came to the museum, but the trainers work with them in an exceptional way so that the birds feel comfortable with the human presence, but are not considered or felt to be pets. They really are honored as wild birds, uh, wild birds who can't survive in the wild anymore because they weren't raised in the wild by parents, yes. but birds who have the choice to be themselves and on any given day, they we may ask them to come to work and they say no thanks and they still get a nice meal. You know, we, we joke that they get uh, three meals a day, free Wi-Fi, and don't have to pay any rent. And it's a pretty <laughs> good life for them. It's really a treat to be able to work there and to see the birds close up, mm -hmm. to watch their behavior, and to get to see how each bird has a unique personality, even within a species. And just to, again, have the experience of being close to wild birds that you see flying in the wild, but responsive to uh, the work that we do with them. Mm. When you're dealing with such a variety of birds, uh, did you have a particular bird that you preferred to handle? You know, I think each one, uh, uh, th that's a question like, which one of your children is your favorite? <laughs> you know, the, the correct answer is all of them are. And, and they each are very unique. They each have different characteristics. One of the birds that's been a, a favorite of mine and the audience for the last couple of years is a crested caracara that we hmm. have with us. And I think the reason for that is because it's a very, very smart bird. Hmm. Some of the other birds, the great horned owl is spectacular and it's really exceptional. 
Um, great horned owls are superior with what they do. They see and hear very well. They're excellent hunters. They don't have a lot of room in their brain for uh, processing uh, uh, or problem solving, I guess. So they do what yeah. they do very well. But, you know, for example, once we released a great horned owl to start her routine and there was a caterpillar walking across the path and it had to watch the caterpillar for five minutes on the perch. You know, the narrator is trying to keep the audience happy while they don't see what's going on. <laughs> and we're waiting for the darn caterpillar to get across the path so the owl can say, OK, I guess I'll go ahead and fly. The crested caracara, on the other hand, is a problem solver, kind of like the roadrunner you mentioned at mm -hmm. the beginning of this show. When you see an animal or a bird that's thinking, that's responding, that's adapting to new behavior, it, it engages you very differently. So uh, this crested caracara that we have is just, they look kind of bizarre. I, I joke, they look like they were uh, created by a committee at the Cartoon Network. They're just all these <laughs> sort of funny things. they beautiful birds. Uh, that are colored wonderfully, but you can pretty much see him thinking out loud. And, and that's what makes him a real treat to work with. Hmm. When you think back to all these experiences you've had, and you mentioned this Caracara, uh, what do you think is one of the most memorable experiences you've had so far as a handler? Well, you know, it's hard for me to think of any one. I know it's um, similar to my last question where I'm yes. asking you to choose a favorite. <laughs> You know, I, I will tell you, it's one of the interesting things about handlers that, that goes to show the exceptional skills of our staff is they have, uh, in the past at least, we've had five different volunteers every day working with uh, two to three staff that are on duty that day. So they have to train five human beings, or 35 human beings, five every day to do five different jobs every day and do them the exact same way so that from the bird's point of view, Whatever human being is there is doing the exact same thing with the same cueing, hmm. the same responses, the same motions and actions. And so the trainers uh, for the Raptor Free Flight Program are training birds, but they're also training humans. They have to train <laughs> 35 humans in five different jobs to do them all exactly identical for the bird's welfare so that sure. a bird doesn't say, wait a minute, I thought that the staff is supposed to do this to cue me to go here, but this person's cueing me differently. If we were to cue the birds differently or creatively, the bird may quit flying for us for a half a year. Mm. So the trainers have to train we humans to do it very well. And the fact that we have five different jobs that we may do, each one is wonderful. Uh, you know, sometimes you're assigned to Cat Canyon, so you get to be above the show, watching everything and having birds come to your glove during the show, calling the birds to you and having a raven or a Harris's hawk come to your glove where you hold it for the audience that's around you. Other times, again, uh, you know, one of the spectacular positions is working with the ferruginous hawk, which mm. is the largest soaring hawk in the United States. Ours weighs about four pounds. And when that bird comes back, some of the birds come back and go into their enclosures on their own. Some come back to a glove and then you walk to them to their enclosure. And as I said before, it's bird choice. We never place them in their enclosure. We never walk them into an enclosure. Mm -hmm. We open the door. There's a treat inside. And basically we say, you want to go in? We got dessert for you on the table. And the <laughs> bird chooses when to go in. But the bird goes into the enclosure on their own. We don't walk them in. But with the ferruginous hawk, when she's uh, leaving the demo site, and sometimes she leaves after finishing her routine, sometimes in the middle of the routine, she just says, you know, I'm out of here, and she heads back. And you stand up and have this, you know, four-pound four, four pound bird with a four- or five-pound wingspan coming at you at 30 or 40 miles an hour and hitting your glove. Um, mm. Because she was raised in captivity, she never learned to land gently. So she oh. hits your hand hard. And then you sort of walk her to her uh, carrier and open the door and say, I, I got a nice mouse inside there for you if you want to <laughs> go inside. That's a spectacular treat. I mean, any, any day you have assignments that each one carries its own special fun. Uh, so really, you know, I love all my children the same. And I love yes. all the birds and the bird experiences at Raptor Free Flight. Because it's variable from day to day, there's always something exciting happening that hasn't happened for you in three or four weeks. And, and you get to revisit a relationship with a different bird. 
That's definitely something as an outside observer I would not have guessed about bird handling is the impressive level of consistency that has to be maintained behind the scenes by all these volunteers because you don't have one full-time person who's working with a bird for such a long period of time. Instead, you have so many. Uh, and one detail I wanted to go back to on the Fruginous Hawk, mm -hmm. you mentioned uh, your wording was the largest soaring hawk. Can you clarify that? We have a number of species of hawks in the United States. Mm -hmm. The ferruginous hawk is the largest one of them. Okay. It's almost eagle size, and people look at it and say, boy, that's that's a big bird. That's an eagle. It, yeah. it is very regal in its looking, in how it looks and how it presents. But they're bigger than a red-tailed hawk. They're mm -hmm. bigger than, you know, Swainson's hawks or uh, common black hawks or any of the number of red-shouldered hawks. Whatever, whatever hawk you have in your part of the country, sure. the ferruginous hawk is larger than that. Okay. It's not larger than a golden eagle or than a bald eagle, mm -hmm. but it's larger than those big hawks. And soaring hawk is to differentiate it from an occipiter or other, other type of raptor. It's uh, the hawks with the big wings that you may see soaring on a thermal above your head. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, that, that, that was the word that caught my attention was that you attach soaring to largest. So that's why I asked. You know, I don't know why I said that. That's, it's the <laughs> pairing that's in my mind for defining it. So. That's fair. <laughs> so one last thing I wanted to bring up. Our audience will f soon discover when they see the show notes and some of your other work, the links that you have, that you uh, love photography mm -hmm. and you take quite a few pictures of birds. One phrase I've heard from you in the past was the phrase, one more. Mm -hmm. What is your next bird, or what bird are you looking for to photograph? Well, at this time of year, I, I like to try to find uh, great horned owls. Mm -hmm. um, but this is a nice season for nesting birds, whether you're talking about vermilion flycatchers or cooper's hawks or uh, any variety of hummingbirds. Uh, birds are nesting at this season, and so... It is nice to be able to see that part of their life and to be able to photograph birds on the nest, birds bringing food to the babies on the nest. So that's what I look for. Uh, that, that just one more phrase comes from a description I made. I once went to a, a photography workshop by someone who was paid by Nikon to test out its equipment and to use its equipment. And, you know, he's sent all over the world doing fantastic stuff. And he said one of the questions he always get is, how many lenses do you need? And his response was just one more. Mm. So uh, many of, of we humans always want more than what we have. We're always looking for something else. And I think with with birding and with photography, you never finish the day and say, that's it. I've seen all that I need to see. I've taken all the pictures I want. You just want to get one more picture. Even on a good day of photography or birding, you want to go back and see a little more of a certain bird. Or you took your pictures and say, I missed this one, or I'd like to get one with this element in it. And that's part of the fun of this hobby of both photography and birding is that there's always something else interesting out there, whether it's a bird you haven't seen or just you want to see more of a bird or more of a bird doing some kind of behavior or activity. And with photography, for me, it's just trying to capture some of those things. Um, I'm less of a person going out to try to make a list and get numbers and see more and more of certain things. I love seeing new birds also, uh, but I enjoy seeing bird behavior more and just being able to capture that with my photographs and being able to share that. So uh, there's always something out there. And, uh, you know, that's part of the, the pleasure of the hobbies that I've acquired is you can do it anywhere and there's always something that's going to capture your imagination or grab your attention. You know, we're recording this in Tohono Chul Park, so when you come here, uh, you know, I never know if what I'm going to find to shoot pictures of is the lizards or the Cooper's hawk that we hear in the background or some incredible flowers or butterflies. Uh, I may come here thinking I want to find one thing and then something else jumps out at me. And uh, so that's the fun. And then I'll come back again in another week because something else is sure to, to grab my attention. I agree. That's one of the things that keeps me coming back to the same location, a similar time of day. I might see the same birds, but each time it's a, it's like a new experience. Yes. You see a different angle, capture a different shot. The light hits the bird in a different way mm -hmm. and you're able to see that, uh, whatever that bird may be in a different light. <laughs> yeah. I'd like to thank Dan for joining us today. And I'd like to thank you for listening to today's episode. If you enjoyed the podcast, please follow or subscribe on Spotify, Apple podcasts, or wherever you are listening to this episode from. 
You can visit lookingatbirds.com for show notes, a show transcription, and pictures of the great horned owl taken by Dan. And maybe we'll try and squeeze in a few more pictures of the birds he mentioned. Until next time, keep looking at birds.